Welcome to Austin Design Week, day two, um, all about futuring. I'm so excited to have you all here today. You can follow along across a plethora of social media platforms, pick your poison between Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. We highly encourage everyone to um, help and, and spread the word on social media and, and to be a part of the conversation online in this virtual world. So please use hashtag ADW21 and hashtag futuring when you're sharing the amazing events that you're visiting, including tonight's. Um, I really want to tell you guys also about how you can find the rest of the schedule. You can visit this short link, um, bit.ly slash ADW21, so you can see the lineup of amazing free events they have all week long. This is the last event of the night for Tuesday, but we still have three more days of incredible programming um, that's all been designed by amazing people like tonight that you're going to hear from. So it's really incredible that you're getting to hear designers from across Austin um, and all different types of design. Um, one last thing I want to say before we kick things off is that we do have captions available. You can turn those on in the bottom of your screen by clicking live transcript. Um, we also have an interpreter joining us. So um, for those of you who need that assistance, we have it here for you. And so please, we encourage you all to use that to follow along. Now, without further ado, it is my app. Oh, just kidding. Sponsors, we have to thank our sponsors. They're the ones that keep this wheel of turning. Big thanks to our top champion sponsors, Zebra and PayPal. Um, huge thanks to the Label Collective for making all these beautiful designs, Marketing 360. Uh, Material, uh, Cushing Terrell, Frog, Mathis, Pateo, Bottle Racket, IBM, and General Assembly. Without you, none of this would be possible. So please also, when you're tagging and posting, don't forget to show a little bit of love to our wonderful sponsors. Um, we really, really require them to keep everything free for the community. Now, without further ado, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce you all to Melanie Kale um, so that we can talk about the future of, what oh, was shoot. Melanie, tell me what it's called again. Um, the Here the Future, the Next Generation. Yes. Well, design, <laughs> hearing accessibility. <laughs> you have it a long night, so uh, we know how that hosting goes. Well, wonderful. Well, let me, it's, um, it's good to have everybody here and to see these friendly names pop up. And we know that some of you have found your way into the chat. That's good. We are so excited to be hosting today. So I will, without further ado, share my screen, which is going to interrupt um, the other one. So let me just click and share. Wonderful. Can everybody see that? I'm going to take that as a yes. Oh, I All can right. see it. I wonder if, the, <laughs> yes. Okay. Looks like people can see it. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, we're so excited that you chose to spend your Tuesday evening learning how to make the design world, the people, the design world a bit more accessible, which ultimately makes the world more accessible. Um, we're really excited to share what we've learned um, in our journeys with lived experience and working with people with lived experience um, to um, push practice. So my name is Melanie Kale. I'm an independent strategy director and facilitator. I uh, most recently was at Facebook in the community impact team, but spent um, the 10, 12 years before that working in a variety of uh, design for social innovation fields. You can see how to, to, to have a conversation with me there and I'll um, have my colleagues introduce themselves as well. Ariba. Hi, I'm Ariba Jahan. My pronouns are she, her, hers. Um, I'm currently the vice president, vice president of design and innovation strategy at the Ad Council. Um, in my prior not so distant life, I did biomechanical engineering and medicine. Um, so I'm a huge fan of cross pollinating knowledge and and um, and disciplines to bring things together, whether it's design or um, social impact. I'll pass it over to Paula. Okay. Hi, I'm Paula Pfeiffer from Brazil. I am a bionic woman, a writer, and a community builder and a content creator. And basically, I'm deaf, but I can hear through technology. I have two cochlear implants, and I lead the biggest online community of hearing impaired people in Latin America. Ah. 
Well, I can't be more thrilled to be hosting um, with both of you ladies. We're gonna be collaboratively hosting today. It's a little bit of an experiment, passing the mic um, before getting to a conversation, our version of a panel. Um, we're each gonna bring distinct perspectives, but many of us have worked in each other's worlds. So hopefully our conversation will allow those um, uh, perspectives to cross pollinate as we get further. Um, without further ado, we wanna meet you guys. So if you don't mind introducing yourself in the chat, who you are, your name, if you have an affiliation, you can share it, but you can also just be a, a free free agent. Tell us a little bit of your role. Um, we have we know that we have everybody from designers to consultants here to product leaders. What's your, what's your perspective? And do you have anything you want to learn? Anything coming in there, Eva? Not yet. All right, well, we'll let, we'll let the room warm up. Please feel free to drop that in the chat because I think it's gonna really help us get to know you better. The other thing I wanna invite you to do as you're dropping in the chat and saying hello to one another is at any time you can start to, you can put questions in the Q&A queue. So if something comes up that we're sharing that sparks a question, you can put it in the queue and during the conversation, um, we're gonna leave 10 to 15 minutes for um, group questions. All right. I wanna keep this going. So um, you know about the, the accessibility option. We're thankful to have that Austin Design Week um, values that and is modeling that here today. Um, you just push the live transcript button in um, the bottom right of your toolbar and it should allow you, if you need any help, feel free to um, reach out directly to Austin Design Week in the chat for any assistance. Um, all right, so what are we gonna do today? We're gonna start with a little bit of 101. So we level set and have a shared group of information. Then each one of us is gonna share a little bit of uh, Spark Chats. Um, Paul is gonna dive deep in with her community and then um, Ariba and I will both share a little bit from our learning and then we'll have a conversation um, and hopefully learn something along the way and be a little inspired too. Um, we're excited because we think um, there's a lot of people that can talk about the tech specs that come with accessibility and all the standards, but we hope that this conversation, this, this, we won't go on each way that you put the pixel, um, but we are going to talk about how to be intersectional, community-led, and collaborative in your design process um, to elevate the great technical information that's up there um, around accessibility. All right. So let's get started. Before we do that, everybody, any any quick hellos? What are you noticing in the chat? Um, oh, we have um, we've got so many students here. It's pretty impressive. So many <laughs> students um, from medical school to undergrad to grad school, um, design school. Everyone just tuning in to a conversation on accessibility. This is great. I love it. Well, we'll make sure to save this chat to be able to follow up um, with any of you and you can always reach out to us on Facebook. So, so we have this the same um, level set of information. And because I, I, I'm an ally here, that's the hat, I'm a designer and strategist and ally and that's the hat I'm wearing today. I've been very humbled to learn a lot. So I'm gonna share a little bit of what I've learned and been awed by, by the accessibility community. And then Ariba is gonna share some innovations um, that, she's, uh, that she's, that inspires us for the future. And then we'll say how we get there. So I want you to take, um, for a moment to just put this number perspective in your head. We're gonna talk about hearing accessibility today, but hearing accessibility is one type, hearing loss is one type of disability that calls for new types of design. There are over 1 billion people in the world or 15% of the world's population that live with some form of disability. Um, and disability is the, the delta, the intersection between a person who has a health condition that might impair some sort of practical functioning and the, the limitations of their environment, not themselves, their environment that prevents them um, access um, independent activity or participation in the world. And it's the designer's role to help make sure that those personal tools and environments bridge the gap. We consider the needs of people with disabilities to design products that can be used independently, uh, um, as independently as possible. Our goal is to bridge the gap. You often see accessibility talked about at the same time as universal design, and there are some shared conversations there, but we're really passionate about what it means to center communities um, 
that uh, have disabilities um, in the conversations to make sure that their needs are being met and then spilling out um, and seeing how that benefits the world around us. So let's start with knowing a little bit about the size and scope of hearing loss. Um, for a moment, just pause. Um, how many of you know someone with hearing loss? I want you to take a second to kind of get them in your mind's eye. Um, and maybe you also um, may personally experience hearing loss. So put them in your mind's eye. Um, what's something that frustrates them? For my grandma, it was often missing parts of a conversation at holiday dinners um, and feeling like she was left out. What, um, what's something that helps them? For Paula, I remember this kind of light go off when we were hosting a session in San Francisco and your room had a visual call um, service button in your hotel room to get visually the support you needed from the front desk or when someone turned towards you to speak, to show lip reading and make collaboration more possible. How must people feel when they miss out from something or when they can fully participate? These are the people that we're designing for today. I think we all know somebody who has hearing loss um, and uh, that is important to hold in all of these big numbers. And Austin itself is a community in which tech and hearing loss are right in dialogue. Austin was one of the top deaf friendly cities ranked uh, about four years ago um, with a lot of accessibility accommodations. It also has some very large influential deaf communities um, as it's the home for the Texas School of the, the Deaf right down in kind of SoCo south of the river. Um, and it's one of the emerging tech cities in the U US with 16% um, uh, of all jobs in Austin being tech related. It's two things that work together really well for this conversation. So there are 1.5 billion people that suffer hearing loss globally, um, according to the WHO this year. 5% of that hearing loss, or about half a billion, is disabling, so requires some tool or can be aided by some technology to support it. And 1 million of those are cochlear implants, which probably could be many, many more, but it's a very expensive technology. By 2050, they, they estimate that one in four people will have some loss um, because there are 1 billion young people at risk of preventable hearing loss from our use of AirPods. So this is a very present issue for us. And beyond the experience of not being able to fully participate or be heard or hear, um, hearing loss um, has other trickle down effects. It can limit learning and educational outcomes if you can't fully participate. It's known to limit job participation if there's accommodations that aren't provided. Um, and it can affect economic outcomes for the long run. An investment in hearing loss, I think it's something like every dollar invested in hearing, hearing loss technology has like 15, 10 to $15 of return on investment. So this is not, this is a very important um, holistic issue for people who face it. And the case for accessibility is much bigger than meets the eye. And I think this is really important in the design space that not only that we center um, uh, hearing loss, um, the people who are suffering from hearing loss, but I think we were all very intrigued by the kind of scales, um, uh, uh, the scale of what accessibility can do. So we think there are kind of three, um, three lenses that you can use to broaden this case um, for accessibility. The first is diversify. And I think uh, Paula, your community does this so well, um, recognizing that there's diversity in the hearing loss community. It's not just deaf um, people signing or old people who need hearing aids, even though there are a third of older people from 65, one in three older people, um, uh, often require have some form of hearing loss, um, but it's children, it's people acquire in different ways. The degree of loss, the type, the onset, and the type of accommodation, if at all, differ. Um, so one size doesn't fit all in this community. So seeing diversity is the first step to designing for it. The second is expanding the accessibility, um, hearing accessibility, recognizing that hearing accessibility benefits more than people with hearing loss. This is one huge thing to remember with any sort of design for accessibility is that there are many people beyond the initial population that need similar accommodations 
for different disabling um, conditions. So auditory processing disorders, right? Three to 5% of youth have processing disorders. Military vets come back with often hearing loss and auditory processing disorders from the, the sounds that they're exposed to. People with developmental and cognitive disorders like ADHD or autism often really benefit from things like captions because it increases learning and focus. And older adults are aided by any sort of hearing technology because it can actually help prevent um, the decline associated with um, aging and even make the effects of dementia and Alzheimer's less. And the third thing that we wanted to say in terms of accessibility is that accessibility features improve experience, choice, and independence for everyone. Um, and making the case in technology companies sometimes can be very, very difficult. Um, but if we broaden our use case, we can also know that um, the way in which we interact with the world is often aided by hearing accessibility interventions. Um, so there's very basic things. Captions, for example, benefit non-native speakers. 20% of US speakers speak a language other than English at home. Having captions turned on often increases their um, people's ability to learn English, to participate or learn the language that they're um, uh, in, read it and, and fully engage with it. Um, temporary disabilities, right? How many people have had an ear infection or noise or swim, uh, swimmer's ear or any, anything like that? Oftentimes we have temporary hearing loss. Sometimes it's situational. Maybe you're breastfeeding and you, you're watching a video on the side and you don't want to wake your child or you don't want to interrupt your child or you're on the train and don't want to be um, rude and interrupt your neighbor. Situational hearing, hearing impairment or need for accessibility is super common. And some people just prefer it. Maybe they have a learning style that's different. Maybe they're multitasking. Um, they found that uh, 85% of people watch videos on Facebook without the sound on, and 40% of people watch Instagram stories that way. So people are already not participating in the full sensory experiences of their technology, and accommodations make their choice um, uh, more effective. It also drives engagement for those who are sharing information online or building their business using these tools. So the case for accessible design is really, really clear and who, when accessibly improves for and by folks who need it the most, everyone benefits, it affects every experience. So when somebody tells you that um, there's just not enough people that this would benefit, um, it's really important to think creatively about the broader case at hand. I'm gonna pass it to Ariba, who's gonna give some inspiration about what we've been seeing in some accessible design um, innovations in the space. Ruba? Yeah, thanks, Mel. Um, so it's interesting, right? Like even within this, um, this webinar, what you see is diversity in hearing loss between Paula and I. I uh, rely on hearing aids, but in a setting like this, where we are uh, tuning in virtually, I actually can't use my hearing aids and I have to use AirPods and make sure that all noise cancellation is enabled and everyone is away and I'm relying pretty heavily on the captions. So um, I think that is what the critical point is about uh, seeing that diversity come alive. I mean, seeing that diversity for what it is and knowing that not all, um, not all individuals with hearing loss has the same experience, but also not all uh, people with disabilities have the same experience, right? Um, so when we talk about accessibility, there's two, thing, two things to keep in mind. One is the creation of products, of devices, tools, and experiences that really help facilitate that mismatch, that delta that Melanie was talking about between the environment and our bodies and our ability to experience our, our, um, our environments. So that's where um, you know things like hearing aids, cochlear implants come in. But it also means to design products and services that consider for disability experiences right from the beginning. That's when we're talking about making sure the web is accessible, making sure pro your products um, and, your, and your web and your digital experiences have like alt captions or alt text and um, something like Zoom can enable captions, right? So that's the integration of separate tools um, and devices that we might be using or making sure that the products and experiences you're creating right from the beginning is accessible. You can continue to the next slide. 
So um, some of these you may already know of. So things like um, personal devices, that might mean my hearing aids or polycochlear implants, um, sign language. Oh, was there a signer that was joining us? I don't know. There was, but I haven't seen them come through. Okay. Um, thanks for letting us know, Robin. Um, that is Robin, one of the amazing Austin Design Week volunteers. Um, so we, so there's also um, sign language. And even though in America, the most common one you hear about is American Sign Language, that is not the only sign language that exists but often um, that is the one that's being popularized and other cultural sign languages are not often spoken about or popularized and that also creates division. Um, there's lip reading. I rely on lip reading really, really heavily. Um, so masks were really hard for me. Um, there's, there's devices that amplify sound and there's ways to amplify and make sure the acoustics in an environment really, really allow sound to be heard clearly. Um, there's things like visual aids and alerts where you may have um, a system inside your house where if the doorbell is rung, um, like a light flashes in front, of, in front of someone so they know, oh, someone's at the door. Um, there's also visual aids, things like cards that someone um, who is deaf might have in their car that may have dictated already, like, I am deaf, um, please, sp please speak to me slowly, um, and, or like their information, so that if they ever get pulled over by a cop, they're able to quickly um, communicate with them and let them know, like, I, I can't hear you. Um, and of course, captions, which is something we see right here. Um, there has been apps like real-time talk to text, which automatically, well, uh, the app itself uh, uh, converts someone's spoken, spoken language to text so that someone who is deaf can immediately read it. So those are some um, different tools and products and experiences that you might have either heard of or, um, or these really, these exist already. And then, next slide, please. Sorry. <laughs> and, um, you know, COVID, in, COVID was interesting where because of the pandemic life and, and the health, um, public health mandates, people were wearing masks and um, many individuals started creating um, holes and pockets um, in their masks so that it can help others lip read. So what's what did happen, so as you can see, COVID built empathy and really uh, created space for more accessibility and people were hacking and innovating even with their masks. Um, but what you can't talk about uh, accessibility and accessible innovations without talking about this other pattern that often happens in the disability community, which is um, when this, when masks like these were happening, um, more than a dozen non-disabled people claimed to have invented the first clear mask to make it easier for deaf people to communicate during the pandemic, where in reality, if you go to the next slide, um, it's actually Anne McIntosh who was trying to um, bring transparent surgical masks into the mask market back in 2018, pre-pandemic, and she's deaf, she's a deaf professor. Um, so it, during the pandemic, when, when this trend was happening, I mean, it's still happening, um, where people started uh, creating, creating clear holes into their masks, um, and able-bodied individuals were claiming to have invented it, there was no credit being given to the actual deaf professor who was trying to do this back in 2018. Um, I, we're not saying that she is the first person to have done it, but it was back in 2018 and um, that wasn't too long ago. So we see this pattern over and over again where adaptive fashion or adaptive solutions and workarounds that are actually coming from the dis disability community isn't getting credited for their work. Um, and we wanna make sure it's, it's moments like this that we can prevent that from happening in the future. Yeah. And 
also in the pandemic, what we noticed is that caption technology suddenly became way more popular, way more used um, to the point where organization wide subscriptions of uh, tools like otter.ai is happening, right? So that's also really great to see. And we're using it today. And then recently, uh, Eternals, I think is the first movie that got released in theaters with captions. I can't believe it took this long to, uh, for that to happen, but we hope to see more movies come out in theaters with captions. You can go to the next one. And uh, Fortnite, uh, Save the World, and Battle Royale are examples of games that have started using visual sound effects to bring to life the gaming experience. So here in this image, you can see uh, footsteps uh, being emulated by, by on the right side, and then like maybe some fire igniting on the left side. So it would be interesting to see how this might translate even into the movie experience, where right now it's a we just got captions in, in a theater experience. What might it look like in the future where we have more sounds being captured visually so that people can have the full experience? Um, so they are talking, there's a lot of different apps that helps to amplify sound or minimize um, ambient sound. There is some uh, technology that's being worked on that's all about denoising and really making sure that that, uh, that technology gets advanced, more and more advanced to be able to isolate someone's individual sounds um, so that you can hear someone even if you're at like a cocktail party. And then this is interesting, I mean, we, oh my God, I'm blanking on the name, well, Google Glass, right? That's what it was called. <laughs> um, you know, we had, we had things like Google Glass come, um, Snap had their glasses. So we've seen a lot of uh, technology come through that has to do with uh, visual and like things that sit on the eye. Um, what could be interesting is seeing um, this move into the future where we are getting like subtitles or captions or live, live captioning of someone talking in front of you and then you're able to see the text. Um, there is a company called Wuzix that's working on that and there might be more and more companies that's working on integrating eyeglasses, captions and subtitles. And then as platforms become more and more accessible, you know, um, so, does, so is the need for our spaces and our cities to become more accessible. So there is a ton of work happening in different pockets of spaces where they're thinking about like, well, why are benches at parks all um, on one side where someone can't really sit across each other and be able to sign? So they're thinking about how can parks be redesigned? How can street signs be redesigned so that we are actually optimizing for acoustic and supportive uh, services? and making sure that everyone can have that experience. And, you know, it's, um, we're seeing more and more representation um, of, uh, of, of dis disability communities in movies and shows. And I think what's interesting is that it's, sh it's shifting from representation as in like, that's that deaf person in the back, or there's a, some, there's a disabled person somewhere in this movie, may not have a line, but it's part of the um, atmosphere, versus now there's, there's actual stories being told about, the, about individuals and also letting, letting those characters be uh, the main character, right? So we had Abigail Herringer from The Bachelor, and now there's Deaf You on Netflix. Um, Prime has a movie on acquired deafness, so I think it's great to see the shift from having just representation to having accurate stories of lived experiences being told and take center stage. I will, I'm gonna out myself. I watched both of these in entirety. Um, and I'm a bachelor. <laughs> I, I have watched The Bachelor before, Guilty as Charged. And it was so cool to see 
that it was talked about, but then it was just participating and seeing people accommodate in super, super small ways. Um, and so, yeah, I, 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 it sounds like silly in some ways to be like social like reality TV, but I actually, I think there's a lot of, um, once that becomes the normal discourse, it's really, really popular. Um, it's really, totally. really Totally. I think for, even for me, it normalizes me wanting to ask for accommodations. When you see it happening, it's like, oh, okay, that's right. I can do that. Um, versus feeling like, oh, I'm going to inconvenience someone or like, I don't want to have to repeat this again. Um, totally right. It's and also, it also teaches allies how to be allies. Um, as an ally, I had to learn to be self-conscious about not putting my hand on my mouth when I talked and leaning towards um, Paula and um, her colleagues when I was in meetings. And you saw those accommodations. So I think media is a great way to teach each other how to be, what, be with one another um, in cool ways. And the last bit, sorry. <laughs> Oh, no. um, and I think what's happening now, right? There's a huge shift happening. We've gone from um, adaptive, adaptive clothing being called just like functional clothes or like workarounds or hacks to now it's adaptive fashion. And um, stylists, stylists are taking credit for their work and it's being um, showcased as art. We've also have a rise and expansion of incredible number of influencers, creators, and community builders where advocacy is going directly to the people. And it's not only just about policy changes, but you're driving policy changes and you're driving more change in your communities and organizations through a collective by creating that community, right? And it's also creating this dialogue and this pulse and this awareness where other people can become more, um, more informed about how to become allies. So with all that being said, how can we, everyone on this Zoom right now, how can we build on this change together? So in this next portion, we're gonna jump into three mini Spark Talks. Um, the three of us wear many, many different hats and roles, but this, for the sake of this conversation, the three of us will bring in three unique lenses to share a bit on how we've done it and how it shows up for us. So first off is uh, Paula Pfeiffer. Um, Paula Pfeiffer is a disability expert, a communication strategist, writer, and community entrepreneur based in Brazil. Um, she founded and leads the largest community focused on people with some degree of deafness who are users of hearing technologies in Latin America with over 20,000 people. Um, and her community is called Chronicles of Deafness or Cronicas de Surzes. In 2018, she was awarded a $1 million grant through the Facebook Community Leadership Program and was the community in residence in Latin America. Her campaign was called, I'm deaf, but I can hear, reached millions. She has given a widely watched TEDx talk and lectures at Google, Facebook, Avon, Oracle, WPP Stream, and many, many more. Paula, take it away. Okay. <laughs> I must say I'm so glad of being here today because this is like a dream for me for many reasons. First, because when I was a teenager, my dream was to be able to hear and understand in English. And in the past 10 years, I, I've been begging for captions everywhere. So I see the captions, I can talk in English, I can hear you in English and understand. So I'm so, so happy for being here today. Thank you, Melanie and Nariba for this amazing opportunity. And what can I say? I'm 40 years old and when I was six, I started losing my hearing. And my correct diagnosis came when I was 16, bilateral sensorial near, uh, hearing loss, and it was progressive. So the day I received the diagnosis, I made a very bad decision to hide my disability from the world and from myself. So I spent the next 10 years inside the deafness closet. I was ashamed of having a hearing disability and I was also afraid about my future because I couldn't hear, I couldn't control my voice, I couldn't understand speech without 
keep reading. I could not talk on the phone or listen to music. And in 2010, I launched an, uh, a website called Chronicles de Surdez, the Chronicles of Deafness, where I shared my challenges, my fears, and my tears as a deaf woman wearing hearing aids at that time and facing profound deafness in a world with a huge lack of accessibility and awareness about the hearing disability. So this website turned into a huge community of people offering emotional support to each other. And 11 years later, I'm proud of the impact of this work. So to expose my vulnerability made me very strong and led me to transform thousands of lives. So today I feel so grateful to have amazing allies like Melanie. She was my mentor in the Facebook Community Leadership Program. And today I can understand the impact of this work because in the past five years, I used to think about myself like, okay, I'm just a deaf woman, talk about my challenges. And then Melanie made me realize uh, how beautiful and important this kind of work is because we have 1.5 billion people with some level of hearing loss in the world. And many people are in the deafness closet. And we need to talk about it because most people think, okay, you are deaf, so you must sign. And I don't use sign language. I am, the, uh, I am a part of the, the deafness diversity and I want to be recognized as a deaf woman because I am totally deaf. Okay, I can hear because technology allows me to but I am still deaf. The technology doesn't cure my deafness. And I need to live in a world where accessibility exists, where I am part of the conversation, where I can be in places like this, talking to you, like if I am a person with no disability because accessibility is here. And thanks to this, I can be part of this amazing conversation. So. This is who I am. I'm here to collaborate and to answer your questions. Our community is amazing. We have so many people eager to help other people to illuminate the journey of hearing loss because it's very lonely, it's scary, and we need to raise our voices, our hands, and offer support because today the word community means a lot to me and I want to be part of the change I want to see in the world. Thanks. Um, Paula, I love that. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit about um, one of the main ways you gather your community offline? Yeah, sure. We used to do before COVID some amazing events. We called it Sound Connections, where people were the stars. We wanted to offer this stage to members of our community so they could tell their stories, they could um, share their challenges, and they could come out of the deafness closet in front of um, tons of people. We had one event with 500 people eager to uh, make new friends, understand the hearing loss journey, and to understand everything because it's scary when someone says you need a hearing aid. People think so many wrong things about the use of hearing aids. They connect uh, this to having a cognitive uh, problem in, this is not right. So these events and some online events like the Sound Connections Online, where we invited some people with hearing loss who are CEOs and who are in leadership roles in the big tech companies in the world to talk about that, to talk how coming out from the deafness closet has changed their lives and their roles and their work life, it's amazing. So I invite you, we have all this uh, content with English subtitles in our uh, YouTube channel. So please 
join this conversation in. Mm, I love it. Paula, I'm going to brag on you for a second, because I think there's some really cool ways that you bring your community life beyond gathering peer to peer learning and your Facebook group that now has over doubled since we've met um, and your other channels have uh, doubled, tripled, quadrupled since we've met, um, which just means the impact is happening so much more. There's a lot of work you do showcasing the diversity of deafness um, through shareable ways of using technology and then bringing those people into conversation um, and also using it to advocate in different communities. And I like this shift from influencer to community kind of catalyst in a way. It's really powerful. I know one of the ways you did that was training other kind of advocates for their community. Um, uh, we also, one of the ways that um, your work is really interesting is it makes beyond representation visibility, but like making, um, making disability, the invisible visible. Um, together, we worked on a project and I'll share a little bit about it um, to uh, just like we celebrate pride of various um, LGBT community, we use tech to kind of make pro uh, showcase pride of disability community, making stickers, gifts, frames, et cetera. It seems really silly, but this idea of activating online, a very invisible thing was, was really powerful. I think your campaign was, um, it went super viral and was featured all over the place. I think you had one of your biggest superstars had her daughter kind of come out of the closet using your campaign in Brazil, which was incredible to witness. Um, and you can see how uh, using technology to not just accommodate tech, uh, accommodate um, different communities, but then help them be seen and celebrated is one step that's really powerful. Any, did I miss anything? Does that, that, did, did that capture some of our work together? You did so many different things and you're so much better than I to talk about this project. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you, uh, you are very shy. Do you want to share your top three kind of takeaways that you learned from um, working with designers and um, working with designers as a disabled woman? I, I captured some of our conversation here. I don't know if you want to share anything you've noticed. Well, I think we, when you have a hearing disability, you must practice self-advocacy because people don't know uh, your communication needs, your accessibility needs. So before COVID, I think people were expecting so much from people like me, uh, uh, the super advocate. And then people realized they can be the super advocates too. And this is amazing. Uh, the second shift from peer-to-peer -peer support in our community to peer-driven insight. Members are many designers. So we have so many members of our community who are helping us to amplify the reach of uh, accessibility into their companies, into their families and schools everywhere. So this is great because people are taking insights from the community to the world and this drives change. And also designers are becoming disability advocates too. And I think it's beautiful because I see a lot of important voices of design in Brazil, such as Marcelo Salles, who is a guy that I love, because these people are showing to the world the importance of accessibility and the importance of design products and services and, de and devices that are fully accessible from the design to the launch and not uh, thinking about accessibility later to solve a problem, but from the beginning. So this is what I see as the new trends when we connect design with accessibility. Love it. I love that. And it's cool to see um, that you've invited designers join your group just to learn and gain insights every day. And then seeing your community members not only advocate for themselves, but then also use your own group as kind of design, design, deaf by design 
um, is really, really interesting. I'll share just a quick, it's been really fun to walk alongside. Um, I love the DIY reactions. Paula is such a rock star and her community makes so much change that it's hard to, to sum up. But um, as a designer, it was really interesting to walk alongside Paula in her journey because I had been very equipped or very experienced with designing places. I used to design schools. So I would design and design like parks and physical spaces. So I was used to that kind of community design, physical community design. And then I worked for a long time designing products and services. So I would work with young women in, in Uganda or South Africa to design a new HIV prevention product and the materials around it. So I was used to that kind of partnership of design. But this was the first time I had seen um, one thing I noticed when I was doing that work was a lot of the insights I was getting both um, our teams were getting were both from the um, the participatory design process we were doing, but we would also go on WhatsApp, Facebook, um, uh, and, and listen to people's conversations. Um, and we were learning more from those conversations than some of the other places. And so when I got the opportunity to work with design leaders who are debuilding communities, the opportunities for design were like just blew, blew up. And the way that you could design with people, the products that they were actually using was really, really fascinating. Um, a couple of things that I learned though in the process um, is that I have been used to a very traditional design process. We're gonna do some design research. I, I mean, I wouldn't say traditional, I'm kind of a, I always like to hack it and make it more meaningful and more connected. Um, for the people that are participating in it, but it was a human-centered design process. Um, and when I joined Facebook to run this community residence program of these five uh, million dollar grant winners, part of the role was, was to learn from communities and share that with um, the tech companies to make the products better. So to make the tools that they would use to build communities better and to influence culture and change internally. And that's where I really started to learn that there, it's not just about having the perfect design process with well-crafted insights, but it's about strategic influence throughout the project. So we did a lot of things like sharing the stage with community leaders and inviting them into different communities. Um, there was a VP that we found out that actually had hearing loss. What do you know? The outside kind of leader connecting with the inside executive leader. Um, and then we also tried to rally resources from our design community to Paula's group. So not just designing new products and services, but elevating some of the materials, these stickers, these campaigns, and bringing to bear those design skills to elevate the conversations and make replicable tools that community builders were using. Um, we also, one of the main things that was really special about some of these programs and collaborating um, in a more holistic way with design communities was that we could make sure that their voices were heard in certain rooms. So for example, the WHO usually had invited traditional nonprofits or medical professionals or advocates to the table. Um, and because we recognize digital community builders and, and leaders and advocacy groups that are non-traditional, um, we were able to work and Paula's just as has such a vibrant community, they immediately with a little bit of conversation, realize that they should expand who is at the table, even at these global conversations. Um, so I feel like the disability movement needs to be organized in virtual communities um, and designers need to then partner with those communities to make change. A couple of these are some of my sparks. You can feel free to take a screenshot of any of ours, but the real thing I learned was shifting from research to relationships and involving communities throughout the design process and um, not just when you want to learn something or test something, um, that I could use my power as a designer and as an abled woman who is navigating a pol complex political environment um, to elevate and shine the light um, on creators and community people um, and make sure that they were a part of business design, policy design, and strategy. And I realized that it wasn't just about the perfect deck of insights, but that I needed to find what the timing, power, and incentives were to listen to these community members. Um, because too often we've seen that really great research in some of these big tech companies doesn't always lead to change. Um, but relationships um, and uh, political navigation can help push, um, push the right decisions and the right collaborations. Um, I'd love to pass it to Ariba and maybe we'll have time for one question. We've kind of taken a little bit more. 
<laughs> I love that the title just says question mark, question mark. Um, it, never got, it never updated when I changed it, but I kind of love it. Love it. Um, so, so I'll be, I'll be pretty quick so we can make some time to, for questions. So I mentioned that um, I'm also uh, deaf. I, I, um, I have profound hearing loss. I was diagnosed with having profound hearing, hearing loss when I immigrated to New York from Bangladesh uh, when I was eight years old. And after two years of a ton of hearing tasks and doctor visits, I got my first hearing aids. Um, you know, it was a version that my dad's uh, insurance could cover. It became like my window to sounds and environment that I didn't have access to um, for as long as I lived uh, until that age. And, but it immediately also became my window into assumptions people were making about me, um, about my capabilities and what is best for me. Um, I remember being in the seventh grade where I really wanted to pursue a career in science and engineering or, or medicine. And I wanted to go to a New York City specialized science high school. There are public schools in New York City where you have to take a test to get in, but it's focused in STEM. And my speech pathologist and my guidance counselor disagreed with that. They, um, they felt that because I, um, because I, was, I had a disability and English was my second language and my family was, they already knew that my family, we didn't have a ton and we were thriving on food stamps. They felt that because of all of those conditions, I couldn't handle the rigor of a science and engineering career let alone the education. So, you know, I didn't know any better. <laughs> My parents didn't, uh, didn't get educated in America. I was the first person who was getting educated in America and we didn't know much. And we have a tendency to trust systems and people in power, power and authority in those systems to make the best decisions because we think they have access to all the information um, to make those decisions. And, um, so I forged my mom's signature, never got a chance to study, and I took the test. And I got into Brooklyn Tech High School. I'm really grateful for that. Um, but you know, one way to look at that story is, wow, like so much grit and perseverance at such a young age, or like, haha, forged her mom's signature. Um, but the reality is that here is the education system and the um, social work system that is designed to help me. Um, and, and make sure that I have access to what I need um, that's actually uh, holding me back and oppressing me. So while it actually thinks that it's doing something good for me. So this is why it's, it's really important in accessibility to move beyond the conversation about tools and, and accommodations to really talk about the systems that are in place that may be invisible for some, but is very visible and um, a roadblock for, mo for many dis disabled individuals. And so that we interrogate these systems and make sure that opportunities are accessible and, equ and equitable for people with disabilities. And that means people with intersectional identities too. I'm an immigrant, I'm a woman of color, I am disabled um, and we're not a monolith, right? Um, you can go to the next slide. So while um, you know it's, it's speaking of leadership and change and wanting to see change, it's really great to see accessibility now be at a chief level. Um, it's at a chief level at Microsoft. I don't. If you guys know of any other organizations that have that, please let us know. Um, and especially seeing it, seeing this type of role being held by a woman, uh, Jenny Lay, uh, Jenny Lay Fiorio. Um, we need more of it, but we also need it across organizations, government sectors, academia, community organizations, and within the system, not just at tech organizations. Um, I think it's critical for these types of roles to exist so that we can hold accountable not only the organizations, but the systems that the organizations are perpetuating and working hand in hand with and partnering with, right? Um, so we can move beyond these conversations and really think holistically. Um, you can go to the next slide. Sorry, I got distracted by the chat. Um, so, so some of the sparks, um, these are my sparks. You can take pictures of this. 
I think one big thing I'll say is in the design space, I think we are really great at considering for our users and we're getting better at, better at considering and incorporating lived experiences into shaping, informing and driving solutions and ideas um, and decision-making. But you know, the disability community is not just here to be advocates and to be research subjects. Um, we are industry experts and leaders, so it's it will be great to see more and more intersectional leadership um, at organizations and government sectors and et cetera, et cetera. I think it's that is the crux of seeing more change happen, and especially because change is, I think we make, um, we've seen change happen incrementally, but I think intersectional leadership is at the crux of creating more higher and bigger magnitude of change. Agripa, and I think, I, yeah, will this automatically, here? I think, yeah, let's oh. take a picture of this. I just don't know if this will end automatically on us and I don't want it to end mid sentence. Wendy asked a great question about um, books and we put two here and I'm gonna find out if we can give a reading list over oh. to you. There's some great ones out there. Any from you, Agripa? Yeah. I actually have um, a whole a whole blog post that's about um, reading reading <laughs> reading <laughs> books and articles and videos. I, I'll tweet that out so that everyone can um, access it. Does that work, Wendy? Yeah, that's great. Um, I'm not sure if this is going to cut out on us. Um, uh, Robin, can you confirm? <laughs> I just emailed someone to ask. So okay, cool. Okay, okay, good. Um, thank you, Ariva. Do you want to finish up what you're saying, and um, sure. we'll <laughs> we'll go from there. Um, I think um, oftentimes you might see an organization that's trying to talk about accessibility or disability when it's like Disability Awareness Month. I think it's really uh, apparent when we see that happen, but the way that they're leading and the way that they're creating environments within their organization isn't accessible. So start from within, making sure that you're role modeling, but also challenging processes and challenging, um, this is how we do things um, in your design process and make sure that um, accessibility and disability community and lived experiences are being integrated, not only through your design process of products and services, but how they are being served within your organization. Um, so think about what's one small way that you or your team can be better allies or better uh, teammate to others with disabilities. And you don't always have to know who has a disability in order to be um, a great ally for them. And honoring history, I already told you like the great erasure that's happening with the masks. So there's millions of examples of that. So when you are, um, if you're working on a product or service that has to do with disability, uh, a disability, or for in, in this conversation, um, hearing disability, make sure that you honor the history and existing solutions that already exist and elevate those stories. And more than anything, interrogate all the systems and redesign justice in partnership with the disability community, not for us. Um, Paula has an amazing community and she does a lot of work um, there and there are many more like her community. Amazing. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna I don't stop see any questions. questions. Yeah, I don't see any in. If anybody wants to pop any other questions in, um, maybe we'll just, we'll stay on for another five to 10 minutes. If you have to go, you have to go. Um, that's totally fine. You know how to get a hold of us, take a screenshot of this, get in touch, tag Austin Design Week so the rest of the um, community can participate. We'll answer questions online and continue to give resources throughout the week. But we'll stay on for about five to 10 more minutes and ask a few of the questions that we wanted to do in our panel. I know we started a little bit later than we um, thought. Um, and, you know, when we don't include diverse voices in the conversation, not only are they missing out, but we're missing out. Um, and so when we listen well, we can hear new futures together. So um, I just want to, for those who have to leave, I just want to leave you with that um, sentiment, but I want to just have a little bit of a casual chat with you ladies um, before uh, we have to go and we'll leave some time for some questions to come in. So um, um, not seeing any new questions in the, in the Q&A, but 
Paula, I have a question for you. If we can Ooh. start off with you. Um, you are the, wait, am I supposed to ask? <laughs> yeah. I don't remember anymore. Um, you are, you know, you are a leader of a disability community and a creator yourself. Um, how do you think designers, businesses, and technology companies can better partner with people like you? You know, what works, what doesn't work? Well, I think they must practice what I call radical listening. You can't talk about diversity and inclusion if you keep people with disabilities invisible and if you don't recognize the huge diversity that there is into every single kind of disability. We are not here to inspire anyone. We are not angels, monsters, devils, or saints. We are people. So radical listening means truly listening to us regarding accessibility, inclusion, mm -hmm. respect, and ableism. We need structural changes, not just PR campaigns. So designers, businesses, and tech companies can partner with us the same way they do with other social movements. Can you imagine a white man being hired to do a consultancy or a speech about black movements? So people feel very comfortable to treat us as less than. And as you said, we are the experts. We must be part of the conversation of building products and services. So I think what works is respect us as professionals and experts. Don't think about us as free inspirational stories because we are so much more than that. Mm. What do they call it? Inspiration porn. <laughs> Inspiration porn. Yes. Guys, there's so many good um, questions coming up here. Can I just popcorn oh. some of them to you? Um, Wendy is a UX designer and she's curious from Paula or Reba what some of your favorite features are um, for the design and accessibility perspective. Any tools you really like to do use or tools? Paula, I know your community is always using a lot of tools. Yes, I, I use the Google Transcribe because in my experience, it has the best uh, automatic captions and speech recognition. And also many members of my community love a tool called Web Captioner because it has a great Portuguese live captions. Mm, that's great. It's good to know that Paula's community, um, because they're Portuguese speaking, often doesn't have the full range of access to a lot of the tools out there. So a global perspective is really, really important. Ariba, you are you have something next thing too. Um I think I, I've become pretty reliant on captions. I don't know what I'll do once uh, people go back in person. Um, so I'll plus one to any tool at, that allow that. Um, I think when I do user interviews, um, one thing that's really, that's also really been helpful. Um, so whenever we do co-creations or user interviews, we make sure that there's only like three people at max in a Zoom. And then captions are enabled for everyone. And for me, if I have a partner there, um, I don't do the annotation. I'll let my partner do the annotation so that I could lip read. So I guess uh, collaboration and partnership from teammates is a great tool for me. <laughs> One tool, I, I remember Paula visiting you, um, you were a new mom and you had a baby monitor. So you, UX design is also other interactions. She had a baby monitor that when she took her implants out and essentially the world goes quiet, um, it, it vibrated on your wrist, right? When the baby monitor went off um, to, to help you go get your baby and um, put back in your <laughs> implants, right? Yes, because <laughs> I have the option of, uh, I, I, I don't need to hear anything while I sleep. So I love to be, into total silence while I am sleeping. So I had to listen to the baby, but I wanted to be in the silence. How could I do the same things? So I used this bracelet and when the baby cried, it vibrated my arm so I could wake up and help him. 
I love that there's so many alerts and like thinking about not just translation, but all other types of experiences um, are really important. Leslie has a question about how schools and institutions can better educate students about access accessibility. Um, I guess one thing I've been inspired by is joint classes. Um, so bringing together and design hubs end up being a good part of this, but oftentimes they don't fully partner with the other schools. So one school, a couple schools that I think are really interesting are actually occupational therapists. Some of the most inventive partners for a lot of different disabilities um, are occupational therapists. I think social work schools, medical schools, obviously, but um, I think higher education institutions can do joint classes because oftentimes designers, um, occupational therapists hack alongside disabled communities all the time, um, but not don't always get to formalize it into a scalable design. And so I think bringing design skills into some of those classes is really, really important. Any other thoughts from you guys on access, um, accessibility education and design? I think cross disciplines. Um, so what we've done is in the past, if we part, so you're talking about occupational therapists. Another example of that was when we as engineers work directly with doctors and surgeons um, mm -hmm. to watch how they use tools and how they don't use tools to better observe and learn how products need to be evolved. So I think um, bringing more people in from other sectors and other industries, even if they are educated in different schools, uh, bringing them together is good. I love that. Um, are there any small stepping, or any, uh, has anybody, uh, Robin uh, has a question about uh, the, that there's a lot of support and good things developed by um, the community. There's sometimes pushback. Um, and I'm curious, have, have either of you faced any pushback politically or other power dynamics that come into play for the work that you do? I'm gonna let Paula take that because I feel like you might have a lot more experience with that. Um, I, I I missed the captions. Oh, the, I'm sorry. The, the ad Had, with the you receive a lot of support, Paula, but you also probably receive pushback. Um, is there any pushback that you get that frustrates you um, politically or socially? Yeah. I feel very sad because in my country, we face a lot of uh, a strong lobby against hearing technologies. Mm -hmm. So we, uh, the government released um, some new data, official data, saying that in most of the levels of hearing loss, more than 97% of people don't use Saigon language but all the public money regarding to hearing loss goes to Saigon language. So most people with hearing loss does not get access to accessibility in schools and colleges because it's like we don't exist. We are like ghosts. People don't use hearing aids. People don't do cochlear implants. And this is a lie. So it's very hard to face this kind of lobby because in the end, we are all deaf people, but we are different. We have different accessibility needs and how we deal with this kind of situation. Because how can you give accessibility to a small amount of people and forget the, the other people who need accessibility? So it's hard in my country to face this kind of situation. And it's a very strong lobby here. Yeah. Um, there is a lot of, um, there, there are much more educated people than I on this, but um, there are some uh, dynamics in some of the, in some communities. And so it's really important to, as designers, not be smart about that and be supportive um, for access for all um, and navigate that appropriately. I want to make sure that we have people be able to go off to their days, but maybe we can, um, one question I think is a good send off and sorry, we didn't get to answer all of them. There's some great ones here, um, but good things, um, small stepping stones that teams can do. Maybe we can just quick rapid fire out 
ideas uh, for the people who remain. Ariba, is there something small that uh, an organization or team can do to get started? Um, I would say start using assistive uh, technology like tomorrow. Um, don't, in, instead of assuming what a dis disabled or uh, disability experience might feel like, start using things like screen readers, um, go beyond looking at color, um, color accessibility, I think as it relates to what we're talking about, start, start looking at what are the um, workarounds people from the deaf community will be using in order to experience their products. So you can see where it falls apart, where the gaps are, um, and then the burden isn't falling on the person who's using the device to navigate your experience. Love it. Paula, what's something small that a design team can do to, to um, tomorrow to be more friendly to accessibility? I think the best thing is to ask people with, with uh, some impairment in your team, what do you need, what do you want, you know, because sometimes we don't need anything, sometimes we need something more complex, sometimes, sometimes the solution is very easy, so you need to ask because people feel so ashamed of offending us or asking the wrong question, but there is no wrong question when we are talking to someone, even when you are talking to someone who has a disability. Mm, love that. Um, and then I would say it's, it, it starts with then listening. Um, and one great way thing you can do tomorrow is depending on who you're serving, whether it's more, um, uh, maybe it's deaf and hearing, uh, abilities, maybe it's other types of experiences and experiences with disabilities, is follow creators, community builders. I mean, TikTok, YouTube, Facebook, mm -hmm. Instagram, YouTube, those are great ways to tap into real stories, funny stories, um, frustrating stories, the kind of texture of people's lives. I think that was the most enriching thing for me as a designer. And then it was really fun to figure out, okay, what are three story examples I can bring back to my team? So um, following a few hashtags, following a few people, participating in that conversation is a great first step. And then the other thing I would say is keep a checklist, make sure every design process you have accounts for accessibility, diversity, um, disability diversity in your research process. Um, start by just in doing small things to invite people to the table while you build a, a broader protocol for change. Um, and, and don't be afraid to start small and say that we wanna get better. Um, and when you can value people's time and pay them for it um, and hire them onto your team. Um, as partners. Okay. It has been such a wonderful, um, at, it's been wonderful to hold this, uh, share this stage with you for those who stayed on. So grateful that you were willing to give us an extra 15 minutes and really we will appreciate be sure, it. <laughs> we're going to be sure to, um, follow up on social media and then next a day or two with resources, we'll hashtag it. And then we'll ask about the Slack community to learn more. Um, we're glad you're here and we're glad that there are so, so many students here. Um, it's, uh, we know that you're the future. Um, and so start listening now. I think Thanks. like hang on to that curiosity. Um, I think whatever brought you here today, hang on to that, we appreciate it. Thank you so much for uh, joining us today. It's been lovely. Wish we could see all everyone's faces, but here we are on webinar. So <laughs> all right, bye everybody. Bye. Thanks, everyone. You'll be getting a, again, thank you so much to our amazing panelists for joining us. This was an amazing conversation, and, and I just love seeing all the engagement. Um, remember to share everything that you've loved about us. Um, we will be emailing you out a link so that you can provide feedback, not only for Austin Design Week and the virtual community that we're building here, but also for our amazing panelists. Um, I'm sure as, as you know, educators and learners and designers, they love getting feedback so that they can make their conversations even more accessible and better in the future. Mm -hmm. So thank Absolutely. you so much to everyone who stayed. It's been an absolute pleasure and we look forward to sharing more Austin Design Week with you for the rest of the last few days of the week. Thanks everyone.